Buongiorno everybody and welcome to the first session of the brand new developer track here at Identiverse. It is my personal honor and privilege to introduce you to Hans Zandwelt, IIM architect as Smart Zone, and he is going to tell us about how to implement OpenID Connect and off using reverse proxy. Please put your hands together for Hans. Thank you, Vittorio. That was a great introduction. Never had one like that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm uh, running a business that concentrates on developing and supporting open source. And the open source components that I develop and support can be used in a reverse proxy architecture to implement OWASP and OpenID Connect. And I want to talk today to you about that paradigm, that concept and talk about options that you have there, why you would do this, do this, what the advantages are, what the disadvantages are, and what implementations options uh, you have. So first, the concept, right? Why would you do, now what, what is it that I'm proposing? What is it that we're gonna talk about, right? Basically, that's about outsourcing the task of authenticating your users and authorizing uh, your clients into applications to outsource that task from the application or the server itself to an external component, uh, an external service that handles user identity and API security for you. And that component can be co-located with a reverse proxy because it's a natural thing to do. Um, that component can handle authentication and authorization based on hopefully standardized protocols uh, as part of that reverse proxy functionality. And this is a concept that we know from other areas, but you can deploy for both web applications, for single sign-on into web applications, as well as API security and server-to-server -server traffic. That's the basic idea. Um, I hope if you, if you believe me, you can leave the room now. If you don't believe me, you can stick around and find out why I think that's very useful, right? Nobody believes me. <laughs> okay, so what's the rationale, right? Uh, what's, what's the idea behind this? Why do you wanna do this? So first of all, it's not a crazy idea in that it's completely novel, right? It's sort of an evolutionary step, I would call it, uh, rather than a revolutionary step. And it borrows from very traditional models that we've seen over the course of the past decades, namely firewalling, load balancing, SSL offloading, and web application firewalling, et cetera, right? You handle that type of stuff in a dedicated layer, in a dedicated component, and you don't handle that stuff as part of the application itself that you deploy as a developer or, or as a, uh, a business owner, right? That's kind of centralized IT stuff, whatever you want to call it, but you outsource it to a dedicated component. That's the, the basic idea. So that fits very well with the traditional idea of offloading SSL firewalling, but also fits very well with modern models like implement stuff in microservices, stuff it into a container, right? And that uh, is certainly something that, that you can leverage to your advantage as well, right? Put the externalized author authentication and authorization function into its own microservice, if you want to call it that way. So what's the, the big idea behind this is that you can actually also rely in this way on a single implementation of a security protocol, right? If we talk about OpenID Connect and OAuth and you have to um, implement that as part of your service offering, you'll probably look for a library. If you don't, you're stupid. I'm gonna tell you, I can do that because I run my own business, you're stupid. If you build it your own, you're stupid, full stop. If you're not stupid, you're gonna find a library a good library and a certified library, right? There are certified libraries on the market or open source components that you can use to your advantage. Great, that's a pretty good choice. But there's an even better choice because if you have a variety of applications written in Java, written in PHP, written in Go language, written in something fancy that I don't even know about, you will have to find like a zillion libraries, uh, good libraries, and you will have to support that as part of your service offering, right? You will have to upgrade if there's a new version. You will have to patch if there's a security incident with each of these libraries. 
So relying on the single implementation, a good implementation of a security protocol is probably a good thing to do because now you only have to watch one source of patches, one source of vulnerabilities, and one source of upgrades, right? It also kind of provides you a certain warranty about the interoperability, right? Because you rely on a single implementation and you don't have to rely on a variety of grand types that may or not be implemented in certain uh, libraries or languages, right? So if it works for you, you deploy it uh, in a reverse proxy model and you implement it once and you can use that many times, right? You can use one reverse proxy server or actually cluster for many applications and services. You can scale it out horizontally, hopefully, and you can use it to front a lot of different APIs and services. So it makes it easier, right? Externalizing makes it easier and more maintainable. And it works across, like I said earlier, across user-facing browser-based web applications and APIs, right? So start believing me now, hopefully, a little bit. There's down downsides too, right? And I mean, maybe people have more downsides, but the big thing that always comes at it is, hey, I need an additional infrastructure component, right? I'm building a service as a developer, and now I suddenly need a sidecar or a microservice or somebody that runs a reverse proxy for me, or I need to run the reverse proxy myself, right? Yeah, that's a downside. Um, but I haven't come across a single business that doesn't run a reverse proxy already, right? So you can take a look and find the reverse proxy that you already use in your infrastructure for other services, perhaps for SSL offloading, for load balancing, right? That kind of thing. So it's a downside. It's a dependency that you introduce. Uh, but I would say it's, uh, it's uh, less important than the, the, uh, the advantages that you, you, you get with uh, doing this model. Uh, the second downside is that when you put a reverse proxy in between the real client and your actual service, you must kind of trust the reverse proxy to do the right thing and to present whatever identity it has established to your application. And to that end, you must trust your reverse proxy. So how do you do that, right? Uh, how do you create a secure path between the reverse proxy and your, uh, your actual service? Um, and we can talk about that downside later, right? But that is something that you will need to take into account. All right. Very few downsides, a lot of upsides, right? So let's concentrate on single sign-on first. So user, browser-facing web applications, right? How would that work? So this is kind of what the architecture would, uh, would look like. Um, we have a browser. Uh, instead of hitting the origin server that has the content directly, we put a reverse proxy in between, right? And that reverse proxy implements the SSO protocol uh, at hand, which I think a relevant safe choice is OpenID Connect, right? So you plug in an OpenID Connect relying party functionality into your reverse proxy so that when the browser tries to hit the origin server, you hit the reverse proxy, there is no session. The browser will be redirected to the OpenID Connect provider in step number two. There will be an authentication step at that point. Token will go back to the reverse proxy, which is a an OpenID Connect relying party. The OpenID Connect Im implementation will verify the token, pull the user info from the user info endpoint, and present that in HTTP headers, most probably, to the origin server. That's the basic idea behind implementing SSO in a reverse proxy. Uh, one of the interesting things that I put out there at the bottom is that the authentication, uh, as we probably all know, is independent from the SSO protocol itself, right? So how you authenticate to the OpenID Connect provider, could be FIDO, could be passwords, could be a zillion factor authentication, or it could be ex external authentication, right? You just make another jump using SAML or OpenID Connect to another uh, identity provider, right? And this is was also presented, for example, by Netflix in the session earlier, where you create, create kind of a federation bridge um, that even bridges between protocols to sign on users to your local OpenID Connect provider implementation. That's one of the, uh, the things that come along with this uh, architecture. 
So reverse proxy based SSO, what does it offer? It offers you to externalize your authentication and your author authorization as well, right? So it establishes the identity of the user using OpenID Connect, and it gives you an ID token and a bunch of claims that you can now use to authorize the user. Does he have the right role? Is he in the right department? Uh, is he in the right location? That kind of thing. And you offload that task from the actual developer or uh, operator of the service. And this also allows for kind of delegated management if you want to, because if we talk about deployment of, uh, of a reverse proxy and management of that reverse proxy, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's managed by a central IT club or anything, right? You can stand up your own reverse proxy and manage the configuration and the authorization rules as a part of your service, right? It doesn't, it gives you flexibility in management. Can be centralized, can be delegated. It's up for you to, to pick and choose. And that, that model is really geared for containers and microservices, right? Where you can configure your, the service that runs in your microservice using some sort of chef puppet configuration management thing and then push it out to, uh, to your container infrastructure and instantiate the, the actual service, right? Uh, it, it fits really well into that paradigm. And effectively, you've realized kind of centralized or delegated access management uh, managed through configuration, right? Rather than policies or whatever. And you have the, uh, the opportunity to obsolete your legacy WAM infrastructure if you want to, and if this caters for your needs, and it typically does in 80, 90% of the use cases. And like I said, it's a well-established architectural pattern, right? We follow the same thing and the same paradigm with firewalling, load balancing, SSL offloading, and you can combine it in the same reverse proxy that handles your SSL offloading or does the load balancing. You can plug in a module that terminates your, uh, your OpenID Connect uh, relying party uh, function. And like I said, the IDP, the OpenID Connect provider, is where you handle uh, the multi-protocol aspects, right? You do SSO on the very last mile, and then you can do whatever you want in terms of SAML, OpenID Connect again, or a yet to be invented um, SSO, federated SSO protocol to authenticate the, uh, the actual user. So it's a simple internal standardized SSO mechanism to replace proprietary legacy WAM SSO protocols. So some more features that you could benefit from by deploying it in this way is, for example, uh, session management and single logout, right? If you run this inside an infra enterprise infrastructure, there's a fair chance that you can actually achieve single logout, which is impossible on the World Wide Web. But internally, there's a, a good chance that if you use a single implementation of OpenID Connect that supports single logout, you can actually achieve single logout across your enterprise, right? Whereas your mileage may vary if you start hooking up different OpenID Connect libraries that have a, uh, a different uh, level of support for single logout, for example, right? So it's one of these things that by standardizing on a single implementation, you can actually achieve uh, more than with a variety of implementations and different service providers, right? Same thing for session management and for the clustering part as well, right? You can scale out this reverse proxy infrastructure in the way that you typically scale out reverse proxies, right? You do that for SSL offloading and firewall, and firewall uh, functionality already. Um, and yeah, so, for the, uh, for the end application or service to consume the identity information, you still need to pass it on from the reverse proxy to the, uh, to the API or service. And that is typically done in, in headers, right? Uh, you set a bunch of headers that contain the claims of the user uh, that set, for example, the remote underscore user variable, a widely known legacy mechanism to, uh, to pass on a username to the application. And the application can pick that user information up from headers and doesn't need to verify it because there's a trusted proxy in front of it that established the identity of the user in a secure way, right? And yeah, it's, like I said, it works across all type of web applications, right? Your application can be written in Java and Python in Lua C or can even be static HTML 
you put this reverse proxy in front of it and it's protected, right? And you can enforce that users have authenticated and you can apply authorization policies to it that say, hey, well, this static HTML page, even though it doesn't know anything about identity or users, I just want this department to get access to that static HTML page. That's one of the options you get with, with this model. Uh, the other leg uh, next to SSO is API security, right? If it's not a browser-based user-facing application, but it's a machine-to-machine -machine interface or maybe a mobile application, then we talk about API security. Then we don't talk about SSO, we talk about OAuth, right? So an OAuth to reverse proxy-based architecture is kind of similar, uh, but semantically quite different, by the way. You have this client, which is an API client. Uh, could be a mobile app, could be a server-to-server -server client, could be a single-page application as well. We'll get to that in the end a bit deeper as well. So the client goes out to the reverse proxy and presents an access token that it got in some way, right? I leave that out of the picture here because how the client obtains the access token is, is another thing. We're talking about a reverse proxy that implements the resource server functionality here, consumes an access token, needs to verify the access token, and then passes on the information, again, in HTTP headers to the actual API. Um, so what the reverse proxy does is inspect if the token is there. If it's there, it will pick it up and it will validate it using either a local mechanism, like if the access token is a jot, it will verify the signature in the jot, extract the claims to put them in headers, or it may call out to an authorization server to the introspection point published by the authorization server to validate the access token. And then the response it will get back a bunch of JSON typically that tells, uh, that gives you the information associated with the access token. And again, unpacks those claims from the JSON object and puts them in HTTP headers that can be consumed by the API now, uh, which doesn't have to terminate OAuth, doesn't need to know about grand types or JOTs or JWKs or encryption techniques, right? So same paradigm here, now applied to REST APIs. So it, what gives it, it, it results in externalized authentication and authorization again, offload security implementation from the web service developer, uh, allows for delegated management again, right? If you configure your reverse proxy through that containerized um, mechanism again, you can effectively create either a delegated or a centralized access management uh, implementation, on this time comprised of an OAuth 2.0 resource server function. Uh, and again, works across all types of APIs, right? Whether you have a service that is written in Java, in Python, in C, Go, or something else, you don't need to go and find out and find a OAuth2 resource server implementation for your language. You just stuff it in the reverse proxy and, and be done, right? A little bit more on authorization and access control, right? So that's one of the interesting things that you can achieve with this paradigm. But of course you need to make a few choices there. So the idea of externalizing authorization is probably good. Uh, now you can terminate standardized protocols with standard components, keep the application simple, um, and you can apply authorization policies, if you will. You can say, okay, now, that I know who the user is and which roles he has, I can actually enforce whether he's allowed to access a certain URL or not. And that is what you could call medium-grained authorization, right? It's not coarse-grained because you can do more than just you get access or you don't get access. You can do medium-grained authorization up to the level of URLs and paths, for example. You can inspect anything that is present in the HTTP request, including the information associated with the token that is in the HTTP request, including the URL path, including the HTTP verb, is it a get, is it a post, et cetera. And you can mix and match that into a policy, into an authorization policy, and decide whether the request is good to propagate to the backend or whether you are going to drop or deny that request. Um, 
and yeah, I, I'm not sure that's a really good name for it, but, but I, I've been calling it medium grain security, right? You can get a fair level of detail, uh, but it's not as fine grained as some of the use cases out there where, for example, if you want to make a decision about whether you want to show a certain button to the user or not, that's really in the heart of your application. You can't make that decision and change the HTML on the fly, right? That's not going to work. Though I would argue that in the business that I run, that's maybe 5% of the use cases, and the, the rest, the 95% is covered by medium grained anyhow. So, And yeah, so you can configure those authorization policies locally in the configuration of the reverse proxy, right? And I'll show you an example of that later. For example, those of you familiar with Apache, it would be require like directives, like require claim user equals Hans, something like that, right? Um, and you can also um, pull information about the user or authorization information from a local store, right? Uh, uh, for example, an LDAP directory that sits next to your application, uh, which, which holds local application-related user information, you can also consult that, right, on the fly from the reverse proxy and externalize more and more outside of your service towards the reverse proxy. Uh, and yeah, centralized management of the configuration, like I said, again, you can use your container configuration, whatever they call it these days, config maps or whatever, to create your, the configuration for the reverse proxy, push it out to your containerized environment, instantiate the reverse proxy <coughs> service, and, and effectively realize uh, centralized or delegated access management doing so. I've been calling that configuration managed web access management, or SHWAM, as I like to call it. Great name. And yeah, um, you can also think about extending that component in the reverse proxy to actually make callouts to policy decision servers, uh, whereby the reverse proxy effectively becomes a policy enforcement point in the XACML philosophy. And you can even do XACML if you like, right? Because XACML may be out of fashion, but if you look at the REST JSON profile of XACML, well, that's exactly how any of us would write uh, a modern REST JSON oriented authorization protocol, to be honest, right? It doesn't have a very good name, but uh, I try, try to come up with a, a more lean and mean alternative. You, have a pretty hard time. Um, right, so the authorization can be applied to stuff that runs either on the reverse proxy or sits behind it on an origin server, right? I mean, it doesn't need, if you have a web server that you can plug that component, component into, you can also serve content directly from that web server, like, like static HTML pages. Uh, and you can front both web applications and uh, APIs with it, and the uh, the reverse proxy model would be a gateway or an appliance or a microservice or a Docker instance that handles that uh, security uh, functionality, and you can combine it with other authentication and security model, uh, modules as we will see in a in a moment, and basically build that out into kind of a full fledged web access management solution uh, using centralized or delegated uh, authentication and authorization and in a fully enterprise and cloud-ready way, I would, uh, I would argue, and even extend it into an API security way, gateway. And you can do that uh, all using components uh, as, you, as you choose. So uh, some bonuses that we have uh, with this model as well. Um, I talked about um, OpenID Connect for doing SSO into web applications and OWASP for, uh, for your APIs. There's more stuff on the horizon. One of them is Security Token Exchange. It's a, um, a paradigm that stems from WS Star, as we heard this morning, is not very good or great or doesn't have a good name. But the ideas behind that are valid and have been adopted into an OAuth-like protocol. That's called OAuth Security Exchange. And yes, you can think of implementations that implement that protocol or similar protocols to kind of consume an incoming token, exchange it for another token, and propagate that on the back end. Now, why would you do that, right? So one of the reasons for doing so would be to 
publicly expose an OAuth standards compliant resource server endpoint, but your servers internally may still rely on, I don't know, SiteMinder cookies, whatever, right? And you could pick up that OAuth token, call into an SDS, a security token exchange server, have the SCS swap the token for a SiteMinder cookie, stuff it in the cookie, and send the request out on the back end, and you would effectively uh, have now OAuth enabled your legacy API that still only knows about SiteMinder cookies, right? That's a powerful paradigm that some people have, uh, uh, have seen and are going to adopt, some customers of mine. Um, the other reason would be to, uh, for security reasons, right? So if you are dealing with a large variety of internal departments and organizations and acquisitions and mergers and third parties that you deal with, the idea would be that you don't want to propagate any access token that was issued to your customers or your clients and propagate it all the way to the third party or to the department in Australia that fulfills your service, right? You could swap that token into a more narrowly scoped access token and propagate that onto the back end, right? So that's one of the, the other big ideas behind security token exchange. And yeah, if you think that's a good idea and you start thinking about how would I implement it, well, stuff it in the reverse proxy again, right? It's a great, it's a great place to put that kind of stuff. The other one is token binding. So probably was declared dead this week, but I, I don't think I fully agree yet. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the other thing is um, token binding as proposed in the official IETF specifications may not stand a great chance to be adopted everywhere. We'll see about that. But there are also other variants like, like uh, the MTLS, I don't know, I forgot what the draft is called, MTLS token binding, and the new kid on the horizon uh, called DPOP for doing proof of possession of, uh, of tokens. And you could imagine that implementing token binding could be handled in a, in a reverse proxy and actually implement a variety of token binding mechanisms in that same reverse proxy. Actually, again, offloads that task from the developer himself or from the, uh, from the guy who uh, has to operate the service, right? And that is really the type of thing that we get from firewalls and SSL offloading and is really tightly connected to SSL as well. It's a very natural place to do things like token binding in a reverse proxy. With that said, it comes with the reservations because token binding is meant to be end-to-end. -end. Uh, now you stuff a reverse proxy in between, how are you gonna deal with that, right? So there's, there's considerations here, but the general idea of, again, outsourcing that critical security component to a reverse proxy is, is, uh, is actually, uh, I think, a valid idea. Uh, and yeah, this also applies across web applications uh, using a web session cookie that you wanna bind to a client or a channel and an OAuth access token for an API uh, that you wanna bind to the client or the TLS channel. So those are kind of the bonuses that you might benefit from in the future by adopting this. So let's take a look at the implementations, right? Because this is a developer track, we'll actually have to ship some code here today. So implementations, uh, like I said, the protocols that we're looking at are OpenID Connect for web applications and OAuth for APIs. I mean, that's the only relevant choice today, right? It is not to say that the paradigm itself couldn't be applied to SAML or WSTAR, if you will, right? Or a new protocol in 10 years from now. That paradigm is, is I think, pretty universal. It doesn't just apply to OpenID Connect and OAuth, but those are the relevant protocols. Those are the ones that you wanna take a look at today, right? And yeah, like it's depicted in this slide, you might wanna try and pick SAML for that, but it's just heavyweight runtime, harder to maintain, harder to deploy, harder to implement, less secure, if you ask me, uh, and, and less widely available, right? And, and other choices for uh, non-vendor specific SSO protocol implementations. Uh, there, there aren't that many, right? There's CAS, uh, Central Authentication Service. It's, it's relatively popular, but it's not standardized and it's not as widely adopted, you know? So OpenID Connect is really your 
only choice here today, and a good choice. And OAuth, I mean, there is no, <laughs> really no alternative for uh, securing your REST APIs. That's OAuth, full stop. Or maybe OAuth.xyz in the future, right? As I learned yesterday. <clears throat> so if we look at commercial options, uh, yes, you can take a look at the IAM vendor stacks that we, uh, that we have, right? You have pings, ping access, you have force rocks. I'm not sure what the name was, IAM gateway whatsoever, CA sideminders. Uh, Oracle Access Manager, IBM ISM, Keycloak, Gatekeeper, et cetera, et cetera. They all have their own kind of reverse proxy policy enforcement point, what you will, that you put in front of stuff you want to protect, right? It is a well-known paradigm, and you can get it from a variety of commercial sources. And it is traditionally used for intra-enterprise web access management. That's where the thing comes from, right? And if you look at that 5 and then Nginx, well, it's in, still on two separate lines, but it should be one line, I believe, now. Um, yeah, that's an option. That's a great reverse proxy uh, implementation that has an implementation of OpenID Connect as well. And there's the Kong API gateway uh, that we've also seen in a microservices authorization talk yesterday that people use to protect and manage APIs that has an implementation of this paradigm. So those are some of the commercial options out there um, that should prove that it's not that crazy to think about it in that way. And yeah, I made this snapshot yesterday from the, the presentation of Carlos Garcia from the United Health Group, where he talked about uh, them adopting Kong to do, to implement this concept and say, indeed, like, stick to the standards, OpenID Connect and OAuth, and abstract security as much as reasonable from the market, from the service itself, right? So those are sound ideas that you can you can find in other places uh, as well. Uh, well, so if we look at, uh, why well, I, I was going to say non-commercial options, but that, that's, not, that's not completely true. If we look at, at open source solutions, uh, there is uh, stuff that you can use for the Apache web server. If you run a company larger than 100 people, there's a fair chance that you have an Apache server somewhere. And you can, you can stuff your OAuth or OpenID Connect implementation in that reverse proxy or Apache server. And uh, yeah, I'm the author of that OneAuth OpenIDC thing that, that's fairly popular uh, implementation to do that. And it's, uh, it's available in uh, distributions as well these days, right? Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, FreeBSD, and SUSE, they all include a slightly outdated version of that module that implements both OpenID Connect uh, and OAuth. But there's also new stuff on the horizon, uh, mod OAuth, you can download for the Apache server, mod SDS to do security token exchange. And I worked on mod token binding as well that can terminate uh, uh, token binding and, and put stuff in environment variables and headers that allows you to bind your tokens onto the TLS channel. Um, for Nginx, there's Lua REST Open IDC, written by myself. Um, it's, it's slightly more simple than the uh, full-featured ModAuth OpenIDC, but it's still pretty popular, and it's the basis for, for example, for the Kong OIDC implementation um, that people use to, uh, to, to terminate OpenID Connect and OAuth in, in the Kong API gateway. <clears throat> and there's new stuff on the horizon, an OAuth resource server module for Nginx, security token service for Nginx, and the token binding module for Nginx as well. Uh, and uh, as we... Uh, found out uh, a few months ago, AWS started to implement OpenID Connect as part of their application load balancer offering. And that exactly gives you uh, the first model that I presented, right? You can terminate OpenID Connect inside your AWS load balancer, and you can propagate identity information in a bunch of headers. Great paradigm. Um, we're developers, right? <laughs> Not so sure. <laughs> uh, so we need code. So rel relying on headers and environment variables, that's the thing that your application needs to do with that. So the proxy is a trusted component that handles all of the uh, security components and propagates user identity in a, in a bunch of headers. Um, your options to secure the lag between the proxy and the application are typically stuff it on an internal network, right? That is shielded from external access. There's an internal, what do you call that, local IP network running between the reverse proxy 
and the servers, which means that nobody outside of your orga organization can get access to it. So whatever is put on that network in the ACP traffic is kind of trusted because it's originates from within your own organization. If that's not enough, because you don't trust your employees, and you shouldn't, I think, uh, you can use trusted credentials uh, like HTTP basic authentication uh, or, or even SSL client certificates to present, have the reverse proxy present an SSL client certificate on the leg to the service, and possibly even use a signed or encrypted header as AWS AOB does, right? Uh, and uh, of course, then you push down the problem a little bit if you ask me, but still. Um, that's one of the options. Um, and um, uh, HTTP headers is one option. If you have a co-located service, like a service that runs inside of your Apache server, for example, then you can also use CGI environment variables that, you can, that the, the reverse proxy can stuff into the environment of the application, and you can pull it from your application environment. Um, you can pull that information rather than from the HTTP headers. So a sample application, and this is a full application, right? So this is an OpenID Connect enabled application that leverages the reverse proxy SSO component that sits in front of it. Well, the only thing it does is it pulls the remote user CGI variable from the web server environment that was set by the, uh, by the Apache server in, in front of it or serving the PHP code, right? And then it loops over the request headers that came in. The request he headers were augmented by the Apache proxy. You can pull them from the, uh, from the Apache request headers, PHP directives, and walk over them and display them. Um, and then for logging out, you can present a crafted URL. Uh, and that's a full sample application, right? Th this way you can, um, you can enable your PHP applications to leverage uh, that component in front of it. So Java code as well. Well, here it is. You check for a remote user variable. If it's present, hey, the user authenticated, and you can start pulling user identity information from the HTTP headers with request header, ODC claim, preferred name. You get the name of the user that authenticated, right? If there's no remote user variable, then that's an unauthenticated request. And it cannot even happen, right? Because the reverse proxy would have terminated the traffic and dropped it. So when this happens, there's a serious thing going on. You, need, you don't need to cater for uh, recovery or whatever. This is completely uh, bollocks and it shouldn't happen, right? That's why the exclamation mark is there. It's not like you have to do something now. The reverse proxy should have been doing that. So that's how easy life of the developer is by then. Uh, single page applications, um, yeah. That is a bit of a, a touchy and a messy subject because single page applications are kind of a mix between uh, web applications and APIs, if you will, in this context, right? Um, so one of the solutions that two of my customers were actually proposing and I actually believe them and I implemented that in, inside of my modules is that you do not actually handle OpenID Connect and OAuth as part of your SPA. A uh, true single page application would handle OpenID Connect and whatever inside of the SPA itself. I don't think that's really viable. I think it's more viable to push that out to a server side component whereby you could argue, hey, it's not a single page application anymore because I need web server infrastructure, right? <coughs> yeah, maybe, um, but you will need a firewall in front of your API as well, right? So I'm I kind of extrapolate that reasoning to, uh, to handle security in a server side component is not a bad idea. And yes, you can indeed implement OAuth and OpenData Connect server side in a more secure way than client side because the inherent, um, the inherent um, fact that you cannot keep client credentials uh, from showing up uh, in uh, in a browser, right? So the, the less secure OAuth flows you can implement, but the most secure ones you cannot. And you can do that server side. So relying on such a component server side, is probably not a bad idea. But then how do you talk to the server side component? That's where you you push down the problem, right? Uh, you can use a web server, uh, a web session cookie to do that um, and kind of 
try to split your application into uh, browser facing endpoints and uh, and SBA full AJAX request endpoints, right? If you do that, if you follow that paradigm, if you're able to split your application like that, you have a pretty good chance of implementing uh, this paradigm in a secure way. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to say about that. I'm, I'm just touching on that surface uh, right now. Uh, if you want to know more about that or talk more about that, feel free to, uh, to look me up afterwards. But I'm going to get to uh, a conclusion and we would have uh, a few minutes for questions as well. So my summary is uh, create your reverse proxy architecture to handle modern identity and security protocols. You externalize it and offload that task from the application and from the developer. You have a single implementation. That's a really, really important aspect. Don't manage a variety of security implementations across a variety of applications, right? If you stick with a single implementation, that's the thing that you can concentrate on. That's the thing you need to patch and update. And don't spend your efforts around a bunch of different implementations. Uh, centralized management of that infrastructure is possible, right? It's not a requirement. You can have a reverse proxy as part of your application, or you can use a centrally provided enterprise-wide, business-wide reverse proxy infrastructure, right? It's up to you. Delegated management options we discussed. And yeah, it fits the traditional enterprise architecture really, right? We all know this from, from the, the load balancer, the firewall, SSL offloading, um, stuff it in there. Uh, alongside of those components, why not? Uh, but it also fits modern cloud-based architectures, right? The containerized microservices sidecar kind of thing. Yeah, it fits really well there too. So that's a, that's a good thing to have. And yeah, in the end, it will allow you to make developers concentrate on the actual service functionality rather than the security for it, right? And so with that, I'm at the uh, the end of my presentation and we have some room for questions. Sure. <laughs> so you talk a little bit about the security, gave a couple of examples. Do you have any recommendations on like a secure tunnel between your reverse proxy and your application in order to ensure that whatever's injecting the identity into the header is indeed coming from your reverse proxy? Yeah, so I had a number of options on on this slide. I mean, typically it's it's, it's the internal network that should take care of that, right? So because the network is only exposed to people that work at your company, you can kind of trust it, right? That's, that's the, the most widely used idea. Now, if you say, no, I'm dealing with parties that are third parties or dealing with um, components that are managed by external companies that I can't really trust, yeah, you'll have to do something else. Uh, using mutual TLS is one option, right? Just stuff a client certificate in that reverse proxy and use that on all of the connections to the back end. You know? um, and, and if you don't want to rely on that because it's impossible or I don't know what, you also have the option of not encrypting and securing the entire transport channel, but do it on a header, header, header by header basis, right? Where by you encrypt and sign a header that that you pass on to the back end. But like I said, you get into the mess of, okay, how does the application actually unpack and verify that? And you're kind of back to square A, right? Because yeah, you need to come up with a, an implementation of such a library that sits within your service, you know? So I wouldn't want to go all that way, but yeah, it is an option. And you can, I mean, AWS, for example, puts them side by side, right? It injects both that encrypted header and verifiable header, as well as a bunch of uh, um, plain text claims. And yeah, if you trust those plain text claims, you can use them right away. If you don't trust those claims, you have to download the key material from somewhere and verify the verifiable header and go, go, go with that. So in some cases, your application behind reverse proxy may have to uh, carry forward the token or uh, request another uh, resource server on behalf of the user uh, with a JWT token, right? So how we can handle that in this architecture or implementation? Like, you know, your 
uh, app, the app behind the reverse proxy calling another resource server on right. behalf of a user. It may be another cloud resource server or something like that. So how you can do that. Right, right. So that's one of the ideas behind using token exchange, right? So the 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 in the rationale there, the, the, the second bullet there talks about not propagating the kind of external token A all the way to the back end because you don't trust that back end or because it relies or resides in a different security domain and it just needs a different token, right? And yes, you'll need to keep context about the original user as well as adding context about your reverse proxy and your SDS client or your client itself that is calling their remote API, right? And actually security token exchange was designed to cater for that pattern, right? So you call into security token exchange to exchange your token A for token B that you can use on the leg to the third party service and which will include somehow uh, the, the identity of the original user, right? How, the, I mean, that's the theory, right? How that works out in practice is difficult because people disagree on the exact semantics of on behalf of and whatever, you know, and it's not really standardized yet. But I do want to argue that uh, whenever it's standardized, you can implement it in this way and in this model again, easy as it, as it is, right? So that model is independent of the semantics of the, uh, uh, of the protocol or the exact contents of the JOTS or access token or whatever, right? The model is still valid. Exchange it for the other token, pass the other token on the back end, be done, right? Food. Yeah, first of all, great insights there. Uh, my question is around uh, multi tenant. How would it fit into the multi tenant architecture? You know, I would have different tenants, and each tenant, uh, as authentication is outside you know, the scope of OpenID Connect, uh, each tenant may have their own uh, authentication needs. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, each tenant might need different forms of claims validation. So I might need to have a configuration per tenant yep. where I do would do claims validation. So how would it fit in? Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good question. And I haven't run into that in, in practice, to be honest, right? But the theory is that you can use, um, I mean, the configuration of the reverse proxy dictates your the authorization rules, right? So now, so it all comes back to how do you configure your reverse proxy and, and what are the, what are the uh, elements that you can expose to the managers of your tenants to do that, right? I could imagine that you have a dynamic runtime service that even your tenant users can log into and specify their rules and you push them out to the reverse proxy and reinstantiate the reverse proxy, right? So you can think of a whole range of things that you can do to actually configure your reverse proxy. Um, the idea that you have a single reverse proxy and you stuff all of the rules into a static configuration file, that idea I want to get away of, right? Because that then you would run into multi-tenancy issues for sure, right? Uh, another field that you can think about is, okay, well, instantiate a reverse proxy per tenant, right? And have a specific endpoint to your tenant that only that reverse proxy handles. You have options there, right? Um, I wouldn't call it independent of the reverse proxy model itself, and yes, you will have to think about it, and I will have to think about it some more, but there are options there too, right? You are not limited in any way to a static configuration that you load into a single reverse proxy that stays there forever. That's the classic model, right? What I'm trying to get across is, hey, this can be a microservice that you reconfigure and restart on the fly with a new configuration, either per tenant or for a group of tenants or for a country or for your whole infrastructure, but then it becomes a bit of a burden to manage all of the authorizations uh, inside of that single entity. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure I have the full answer to that question, but it's a great question and good to be aware of. So we have time for one last question. Hi, thanks, right here. Great presentation. Um, I, internally, we've had a debate about the use of relying, um, the use of reverse proxies for this exact purpose. And I, for the record, I was in favor of doing that. 
But uh, I'm curious what you would say to some of those people, who, your downside slide, that was specifically the point that they raised, spe uh, the additional resources required to run another, right, an additional infrastructure component, right? Yeah, so There are true. already going to be things like a Kubernetes ingress yes. or other types of reverse proxies yes. in this environment. And yes. the pushback was, we don't want another component to maintain, right? Yeah. It's just one more thing. And, the, and so, yeah. How would you respond to those sorts of? Uh, yeah, so that's the last part is especially the good part. Yeah, how would you respond? I would respond like, okay, so you're going to run your own firewall and SSL offloading as part of your application as well. I mean, it's not a. In the end, is not something you can maintain. That's my honest opinion. We'll move into that direction anywhere, anyhow, right? Um, and and this movement is already going on. So yes, you can stick around and say, well. You know, I want to terminate SSL and do web application firewalling and firewalling is part of my application because I don't want to introduce yet another component. You know, the whole reason why such a component exists is that it's specialized, dedicated, well-managed, upgraded patch, right? There is a benefit in that. And yes, you can stick your head in the sand and say, no, I want to do it all myself, but where does that bring you, right? So, I, yeah, it's <laughs> that's the only thing I can, fair, fair can say, right? Okay. All right, let's put our hands together for our hands. <laughs>